Welcome to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today I think you're going to enjoy a conversation with Jonathan Dotson. Jonathan's the founding pastor of City Life Church in Austin, Texas, and the founder of Gospel-Centered Discipleship. He's the author of a number of books, including The Unbelievable Gospel, Here in the Spirit, and Gospel-Centered Discipleship. Jonathan's latest book is The Unwavering Pastor, Leading the Church with Grace in Divisive Times. But before we hear from him, let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Thank you. So at the time we we're recording this, I just returned back from Orlando. I'm on sabbatical. I'm the worst person ever on sabbatical. And we, uh, I met with uh, heads of denominations in the Orlando, Central Florida area, so the Christian Missionary Alliance and the... I don't know, the Pentecostals, Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the biggest part of our conversation was just how pastors are struggling. So right now, all over uh, the country, the world, we're having this conversation about how pastors are struggling and how are they walking through these difficult times. A theme I've been using is we're going to need reservoirs of resilience, unlike anything we had five years ago, to continue to make it through the next two, three, four, or five years. And so I was really pleased when someone I've actually known, read, endorsed, um, you know, books and stuff for over the years, so I saw him coming out with a new book, and so I was really excited to get him here on the podcast. Uh, we've already you already introduced him, but but um, let me also remind you that you can check out extended portions of some of our interviews at churchleaders.com/plus. And if you're enjoying our interviews, it would as always help if you left a review. Remember, our audience is unapologetically pastors and church leaders. Lots of great podcasts about lots of other things, but we're about pastors and church leaders. So when there's a book come out called The Unwavering Pastor, we need to have this discussion. So um, are, are, what, what's going on with pastors, Jonathan, as you see? Are we wavering? Are we faltering? Uh, are there times we shouldn't waver and falter? Uh, give us a sense of the moment and why you wrote this book. Well, I don't think it's news to anyone that, that pastors are struggling. We have the statistics to show it. Um, the flagship article in April at Christianity Today about uh, not just empty pulpits, but empty pastors, pastors struggling, you know, emotionally, spiritually, under the weight of criticism, both from the right, from the left, uh, dealing with um, the challenges of our cultural moment, politically, whether it's COVID or uh, politics. So yeah, I mean, there's tremendous weight. And in our country, there is pressure both on the right, on the left, and leaders are at the center of those colliding pressures. People look to leaders uh, as they should, but um, often as they look, it come with demands and criticism. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not immune to this. I, I, I at, the, <laughs> at the end of last year, I had my own kind of emotional burnout. Um, I was walking towards our church uh, and I felt my heart decouple from the church in a way that I'd never felt it. Went to my elders and, and I, I just had the, the sense that I, I could not walk into a room uh, filled with Christians that I was responsible for. Uh, it's like a rubber band stretched too far and then popped, you know. And so my elders graciously gave me a couple months off and I was able to kind of withdraw, lament and experience spiritual renewal and, uh, and come back in January. So my story is not unique. I've out of this, I've had a lot of conversations with different pastors all over the country who are struggling because of the climate and in some similar ways. Okay, so timeline that for us because if uh, I'm, you know, usually you write a book, it takes probably almost a year to go <laughs> through the system, a year to write a book before that. So is this sort of yeah. what do you call emotional burnout moment after the book is done? Well, here's the interesting thing that about 70% of the book was written. Yeah. And my heart was to come alongside struggling pastors. Uh, and so in order to do that, I had to draw on years and years of heartache, uh, thorny pastoral issues, um, and just the complexity of our moment. And I think as I did that, I had kind of my wounds open, and then the scriptures open next to me and was trying to treat my own wounds with grace as I looked back. And I think Ed, that accelerated that moment. For me, in which I kind of uh, just had a, had a kind of emotional snap. I, I wasn't angry at God. I wasn't mad at the church. I wasn't bitter. I was just depleted. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was it, that that's the timeline. And so the last 30 percent of the book was written while I was on sabbatical, wow. <laughs> wiping my tears, um, retreating to the snowy 
lake house in Minnesota, you know, and just trying to find my bearings. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if you'd mind, I mean, just talking about like personally for you, like what were the things both internally inside the church, maybe externally outside the church that you were facing? That's a, that was a, you know, in a sense, maybe a threat or, or the pressure. And then, and then, you know, pull them back and seeing, you know, what are you seeing with your peers? What, what kinds of threats are they facing both inside and outside the church? Yeah. Uh, personally, uh, some of the things I've already mentioned, you know, criticism over COVID protocols, um, uh, political uh, dissension um, over different candidates. Um, there was, uh, you know, our, our real, you know, hot flashpoint for us culturally was the murder of George, George Floyd and the church's response to that. So, um, you know, a lot of people are looking for answers and, um, uh, you know, lead, leaders are, were at the pinpoint of, of their uh, search for answers, some charitably, some un uncharitably. And I think we're still searching for answers. Um, it's, it's not all wrapped up by any stretch. So, um, you know, some of the experiences as, as I talk to other pastors is people that they love, people that they have shepherded through hard times, they've dedicated their children, they've led them to Christ, suddenly becoming uh, bitter enemies or one of the most painful things I think I'm hearing is people just ghosting. People that they have loved, and served, and shepherded just disappearing. Not an email, not a text, or if it is an email or text, it's, it's unkind. And so I think we're struggling, and I think I could speak on behalf of a lot of pastors, with kind of a relational disposability when it comes to pastors. Um, we are here for religious goods and services, and that's part of the calling. And there are times to leave a church, certainly, and there are good reasons for leaving a church. But there's this kind of pileup of people, whatever their reason is, just kind of vanishing as though there was no friendship. Um, and that, that hurts. And there's an accumulated pain over the last two years of, of ghosting, of criticism, of, um, uh, you know, <laughs> heartache that has led to a lot of discouragement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm getting emails and, 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 and uh, texts and social media, direct messages, you know, just uh, week in and week out. So yeah, it's, it's pervasive. Mm. Is there a sense where you feel like we've gotten some closure from like those cultural issues, you know, the murder of George Floyd, uh, the COVID protocols? Do you feel like like we've we've got beyond that or do you think that there's like a wound now that's kind of just open and and uh we're having to continuously navigate this yeah well it's a blight i mean that the the racism that runs so deep in our country is a blight and it's uh for some it's a wound for some it's uh, an issue to be ignored so no we've not you know that's a long-term sustained issue that we'll have to continue to address um the COVID stuff, it's interesting. I just got back from Europe. Nobody's wearing a mask. <laughs> in France, in England, um, you know, people are moving on and there are new political issues uh, that people are addressing. Um, here in Austin, it, you know, the COVID protocols aren't really a big deal anymore. So, um, but I think there is a kind of COVID hangover that a lot of people are dealing with. I, I see kind of um, a retreat into kind of what's comfortable for me, less sacrifice, less community, less earnestness about mission. And one of the things that I've noticed is that some of that is not just I'm selfish, although that's true of all of us. Some of it is um, so much has happened to me. I, I don't know how to cope with it. I don't want to add anything else onto my plate that would make it even harder for me to live, like a demanding relationship, like serving people in acts of mercy, justice, evangelism. I'm so, I, well, I've got a hangover from the last two years. I can't handle anything else. And in my experience, many people have not learned to lament, to include God in the COVID hangover, to include God in their sufferings. And uh, as a result, yeah, they're, they're, we're going to lack capacity to serve. Uh, we're going to lack capacity to love people and sacrifice. 
if we aren't including God in those specific areas of lament where we feel depleted, where we feel discouraged. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because a lot of the question is how much of the, well, you call it a cultural hangover. Um, and I walk through in a kind of a seminar I do, I walk through January, 2020, uh, you know, we're debating impeachment in Jan- the early January, 2020, then what's originally called the Wuhan flu. And, and then what follows that the murder of George Floyd, and then the uh, shut lockdown and then extended lockdown division over lockdown and, 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 and then, uh, riots and, and then, uh, you know, the election and stop the steal and then the division over that. And then January 6th, 2021. And I mean, that's a, that's quite a year. I mean, that is a bracketed year that is maybe reflects in a lot of ways, 1968. Uh, I think a, the difficulty is, is that maybe a lot of people, particularly as now we're, whatever, whatever stage we're in now, we're certainly not addressed dealing with COVID in the same way we did in the past. So we're saying, let's say we're coming out of that. Um, in the midst of all of that, the cultural convulsion hasn't ended. If anything, the division remains, the results of the division still run deep and continue to have ramifications. What I found interesting in your book, again, the book is called The Unwavering Pastor, The Unwavering Pastor Leading the Church with Grace in Divisive Times. Uh, well, let's just say divisive times are right here, right here in front of us. But you actually go back to Second Timothy, and you deeply rooted in the Scripture, which so much of your writing rightly is. So it's not a book that is about cultural issues of the day, that we've talked about some of them to start. It's a book about how to lead a church in the times of division. So why the connection to Second Timothy and explain that a little bit? Yeah, well, Paul was no stranger to division, to heartache, to suffering. And I th- this is probably his last letter. He's probably in Rome in a hole in the ground, the Mamertine prison. And he is uh, in touch with you know, suffering, quite literally. Uh, he writes to Timothy, a trusted friend, something that we really need in times of suffering, people that we feel like we can bear our heart to. And of course, he is not just pouring out his heart to Timothy. He is advising Timothy. He's, he's um, writing to encourage his ministry to the church in Ephesus. But there is a frankness in this letter that isn't absent other places, but really piles up in Second Timothy. You know, he talks about uh, Alexander the coppersmith. He names him who did me great harm. He didn't say, you know, I just suffered because of the gospel ministry. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. He says, uh, all who are in Asia abandoned me. This is the great apostle Paul being personal, being real, naming his sufferings. Uh, There's what you might call ghosting in there. There's a personal attack. So 2 Timothy, I think, really opens up the scope of what pastoring can look like as you deal with your own pain and your own heartache. And a lot of us are too busy to do that, or we're afraid if we peel back the layers, what we might find. Some pastors I'm talking to are afraid they might lose their jobs if they go this deep with their leadership teams. Um, If they, they say, you know, I need some time off. So but we have an example in Second Timothy of a pastor who is raw, who is real, and yet is, uh, is, is rooted and grounded in the gospel of grace. So you find um, there at the end of Second Timothy, Paul saying, you know, everyone had abandoned him, but the Lord stood by me mm. and strengthened me. Mm. And that, that's essential, isn't it? That when people abandon us, even our trusted friends, people we baptize, people we led to Christ. There is one friend who will not abandon you, who stands by you. And not just kind of as a witness to your ministry, but <laughs> kneels down to lift you up, strengthens you, you know. And, and uh, that, that has been my experience, is that as I have lamented my sorrows, uh, Christ has knelt down beside me and has wept with me, the weeping Messiah, the man of sorrows, sorrowful even unto death, the gospels tell us. So uh, Second Timothy is, a, is really a great letter for us to steep in as we process pastoral pain in these divisive times. Mm-hmm. And there's much more as, as I address in the book about navigating issues and so forth. But I think you know, that's one of the things that drew me to it in particular. Yeah, I completely agreed. I, I want to press into 
that a little bit more about, you've mentioned it twice already when uh, people ghost you and, you know, if you've been in ministry for some time, I mean, somebody's going to leave your ministry and it's going to hurt, but there's something about the last two years that's kind of made it more difficult. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in like, what, what was it like for you? I mean, how did you walk through that? I think, I think so many people listening are going to relate exactly to this point. Like, how was it for you as you were walking through those relationships that you had to mourn and, and that were leaving? Yeah, <laughs> I think there's different, uh, I don't like the word categories, but there's different types of relationships, you know, some of which you might prioritize an attempt of reconciliation, uh, what you might call a friend or uh, a committed member. Uh, then there are people who were just attenders, you know, uh, kind of a, a leave the church, but you weren't particularly close to them. Um, I have tried to prioritize, you know, connecting with people who have left that I would consider a committed member. And uh, there's one person in particular uh, to dedicate all of his children. Uh, they've been at the church 10 years, um, sent an email about COVID protocols um, and elders sent a response and never heard from him again. Hmm. And uh, <clears throat> Just, was just befuddled. <laughs> uh, I'm on this break that we talked about, this kind of two month leave, and then I'm towards the end of it. I'm in the snowy lake house up in Minnesota, and um, I'm writing the final chapter. I'm reflecting on what's happened, and I see the mention of Mark at the end of Second Timothy, who Paul had clashed with in Acts. And and that is a, obviously an indication of a redemptive, reconciliatory relationship. <laughs> and at this point, I'm emotionally not into, into that. <laughs> I believe in it theologically, but emotionally, I don't really want to reach out to this person. So you, you, you have to allow space and time, obviously, for those kinds of things to happen. I get back to Austin. I'm sitting in a New Year's Eve service that's not our church. And... I get a text um, says, hey, what are you doing here? And it's from this individual. They're sitting behind me <laughs> in this Christmas <laughs> Eve service after I've just been wrestling with, you know, redemptive reconciliatory relationship. <laughs> and uh, they come up to me afterwards and uh, extend their hand. And um, I shake their hand. They said, hey, can we get coffee next week? And I said, no. Mm. But contact me in about a month and I'll be happy to get together with you. I knew I still needed time before I sat down with him. Uh, I, you know, fast forward, we sit down. Uh, he plops down and, and says, I completely blew it. Hmm. I left it. I can make a lot of different justifications. By the end of the day, I didn't leave well and I didn't treat you like a friend reconciled, forgiven. We're not best buds. He asked me if I wanted to play tennis next week. I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> I love him. Um, you know, so forgiveness doesn't obligate intimacy, yeah. uh, but the gospel obligates reconciliation. And I'm so grateful for God's patient work in my heart for me to enter into a second Timothy, you know, bring Mark, you know, Right. to minister with me kind of moment. So, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that. These people left, and you didn't particularly give details of why they left, which is, which is good. Uh, but a lot of people who've left have been sorted out of the church through what, I, what I've written about called the great sort. People are just being sorted ideologically more than theologically. And, you know, we could have differences. You know, people certainly did have, everyone had an opinion on COVID protocols, and we're not talking about that in the same way. But there still seem to be people who have been caught up buying into ideologies and philosophies that aren't biblical, but are also often wrapped into biblical ideas. And I would actually say on the right and the left. Um, so my question would be, as a pastor, you know, right, right, right now you're talking about reconciliation, someone who left and ghosted. What about someone who's vocal, hasn't ghosted? What's your pastoral responsibility and how are you? Because Austin's this weird mix, for those who don't know. It's, it's, it's in Texas, but it's really not. It's basically, you know, it's in Milwaukee. Um, and so it's this weird sort of mix. So you're dealing with some of the conflicted issues 
So yeah. what do you say to pastors and church leaders and what should they do when church members buy into, get caught up, become vocal about these ideologies and philosophies that aren't biblical? Well, uh, Second Timothy has some real clear instruction on this about divisive people um, who use fighting words. Uh, and Paul advises Timothy to have nothing to do with them. Um, he advises him not to get wrapped up in, um, in controversy, in um uh, controversy that is acrimonious so you know every pastoral case needs to be examined with wisdom and with scripture and with grace there's no kind of do that this way every single time uh, but there are categories of you know in second timothy of re reproof uh gentle Correction, not just correction, not just being gentle, but gentle correction. A lot of pastors lean one or the other, and Paul pairs those. Gentle will just let it roll on. I'm not going to, or uh, correction, let me just tell you how you're wrong and you're not gentle. So that gentle correction uh, is so important. I think with someone like you've described, Ed, you know, that that's going to need to happen before they leave, but after they leave, they're no longer, no longer longer under your spiritual care or responsibility. So um, I I would not perceive there to be a responsibility after someone has left the church because they've in effect said, um, I no longer see you as my elder, my pastor, my church leader. Um, now, there may be good reasons for that. There may be bad reasons for that. That's another conversation in terms of the authority that's actually functioning in their life, whether it's their own authority or cultural authority or another spiritual authority that's godly and wise. But uh, yeah, there, there's, um, there's room for addressing this um, in the church. And you know, Paul's pretty, uh, pretty clear. And you know, he talks about Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth. Uh, people are swerving from the truth. And so we've got to use the truth to clarify where we swerve and to speak clearly and biblically to issues, but to do so with grace and to do yeah. so uh, with kindness, to pair gentleness and correction and not just opt for the one that's uh, more comfortable as a leader. Yeah, you talked about the reconciliation that come, came from that, that conversation, that ghosting. Uh, can you give us an example of how you actually led and had some conversations of correction that honored the Lord, kept people in community, um, kept you, again, the book's called The Unwavering Pastor, how you, how you walk through without losing the focus. Any examples on that side? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can think of a, uh, a couple that our elders met with uh, over differences in how we were handling um, racial justice. Uh, we'd had protracted conversations and this was kind of a defining meeting after months. Uh, we are certainly pro-racial justice. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to, I'm going to write a book about it. I'm not, I don't think we're, we've learned enough or uh, demonstrated enough, uh, but we're committed to it. Um, and uh, this evening, the, the critiques were really um, sociologically driven, not biblically driven. And one of the elders um, paused in the middle of the meeting and said to them, can we just try to, in the spirit of 1 Corinthians 13, love hopes all things, believes all things, you know, endures all things, love never fails. Can we try to move forward in that spirit of love as we continue to talk about this? And um, there was a, a, a heartfelt appeal uh, there. And it was brushed aside as a, a Jesus juke. Um, and this elder in particular responded not with hate, not with anger, not with despair. It was kind of like the image that comes to mind. It was like Neo is putting his hand up in a hail of bullets falling. But, the criticisms and the things that were said and the tone. And it, it was such a gentle um, response. At the end of all of that, they ended up leaving the church. And uh, the husband said to me, you know, we're at different places on this issue. 
and but we love you and uh, we'd like to taper off our giving we we know that we are uh, big givers and so we don't want that to impact the church we don't want to slam the door on our way out and um so they did Mm -hmm. they tapered off their giving they were gracious in their exit they didn't take their their differences to social media and throw the church under the bus and cancel the leaders and even as I tell you now, Ed, I, I think I haven't appreciated enough yeah. how they exited hmm. in comparison right. to others. Yeah. Um, so it was messy. It was hard. It was divisive. And it was divisive around racial justice. But because I think of the persistent love of the elders and continuing to sit down and because of their openness to us and their, their, their love and the spirit working them, you know, it was a, it was a departure but it was a gracious, not slamming the door, uh, but kindred departure. Mm-hmm. I, I know our listeners are 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 hearing your stories, and there's probably a a, a triggering and like traumatic effect <laughs> because this is their world, <laughs> like today, right? Yeah. And inevitably, because of that, there are people who are in fellowship that every Sunday they're showing up, and they still look at each other with suspicion, like they just mm-hmm. don't get along, you know, and. And uh, I could think of stories of churches that um, are nearby that, you know, that's just the, the reality of many Chicago churches right now where people are worshiping together and they just don't get along. And yeah. uh, if you were talking to these pastors and, and you are, like, what's your advice around how to, to lead, knowing that there is existing tension amongst church members and maybe even staff members? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we talked earlier in that example the person who ghosted and how I I worked through that. One thing I think is time. Time doesn't heal. Christ heals, but time gives is, is, is necessary for Christ to heal. So we often want reconciliation immediately and we want forgiveness now. And I think pastors have to be patient and remember just how patient God has been with us and how gracious he's been with us. Think of the sins that you have not confessed that God has known all these years, you know? So I think uh, being patient and gracious. Um, Second, praying like crazy for people to reconcile. Uh, We can do no reconciling work. Christ can do all the reconciling work. Some reconciliation won't happen till heaven. You got to have a category for that, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we can't bear the burden of reconciliation. Only Christ can. So time, prayer, I think modeling, like we've talked about here. So you, it, you preach reconciliation in, in relationships and difficulty and bitterness, but you don't show it. It's going to be hard for people to get on board. But when they hear it, and I've shared this story with my church, it inspired reconciliation in other relationships that they had. Mm. Um, they saw that actually the humility and the grace that works in the body of Christ was possible. So, you know, I think there's time, there's prayer, and then there's modeling this to your congregation. And then trust it to the Lord. It's his church. He'll reconcile in his time. His gospel is more than adequate to bring bitter enemies back to being at least brothers and sisters, if not friends and partners in the gospel. Uh, the book is The Unwavering Pastor Leading the Church with Grace in Divisive. I can't say decide if it's divisive or divisive in my life because I say it both ways. <laughs> you, so I'm divided yeah. over this. I have a, I have a sense <laughs> of division. Um, so um, one of the things for me, um, it's interesting to me. I find very fascinating that you're writing this book. You're 70% done. You experience a burnout moment. And by the way, uh, it was me. It was early in the pandemic after the, uh, uh, after the death of our, of our uh, mutual friend, Darren Patrick. Uh, just mm-hmm. you know, for me, with time stepped away and just just had to had to take a breath and for a season. Mm-hmm. And um, so again, I'm not I'm not anti stepping away. And thank God you had elders that did that. Um, I, I think a lot of people would want. That being said, would would want to avoid the time when you have to get away and step away from two months. They want to, they, they would they they want to have the um, 
the path that doesn't involve the season of burnout, to have some sort of sustainable path. So having gone through that, now you can look back in hindsight, you're in the middle of writing this book. This book speaks to a lot of these issues. So what are some ways that pastors and church leaders can avoid burnout and discouragement? What advice would you give? In divisive times, we often have meetings with people who are critical and discouraging. If you're not scheduling meetings with people who are uncritical and encouraging, your perception of the church is going to change. And you'll begin to see the entire church through the lens of bitterness, critique, and discouragement. So it's so important to schedule life-giving lunches and coffees with church members who are uncritical and encouraging. <laughs> hmm. Amen. We, they are part of our ministry. Um, and it's okay to avail yourself of their encouragement and ministry. Um, invite prayer. Tell people you need them to pray for you. Be honest about the pain, as Paul is in his letter, with your leaders and friends. And invite on-the-spot prayer. Not just later, but allow that ministry to happen as you confess your pain. Um, these are some of the things that we can do, you know, as we try to work through this as pastors and churches. I do think the Lord wants to close the gap between pastors and churches and being vulnerable and honest and humble and holding on to a God who does not waver. I waver plenty, pastors waver, but God does not waver in his commitment to us. I think we'll begin some of the healing that we need to see happen in this time. You've been listening to the wisdom and insight from Jonathan Dodson. You can learn more about him at jonathandodson.org. Be sure to check out his book, The Unwavering Pastor, Leading the Church with Grace in Divisive Times. And thanks again for listening to the Setzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews like this one and other great content from ministry uh, at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review that'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. We'll see you in the next episode.